Amen. Glory be to God. If my life is not being a light, then what are we here for? Think about that. If our life is not being a light to somebody, what are we here for? Amen. Glory be to God. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with us, wait for it. Romans. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We're looking at verses 22 and 23 tonight. Maybe some folks read ahead and seen what these verses... Never mind. We're going to be talking about a little, little word that nobody likes to talk about, and it's the word is called pride. Oh me, oh my. Nobody's, nobody, nobody likes to talk about that. Nobody likes to talk about pride. And, 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 and checking out and making sure that we don't have pride in our own lives. Amen? And this is what we're going to be looking at tonight in, in, in Romans chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Pride. The depravity of mankind is pride. What comes before a fall? Pride. What, but what comes before mankind falls and, and messes things up? Pride. What is pride about? We're going to look at those things tonight. We're going to look at some areas about pride tonight that I think that it was, a, it was a, when I was reading and studying into this, it, it brought out some things in, in, into my mind. It was thinking of some things, and I know that's a, that's a wild place to go is in my mind. But, uh, but the thing is, is looking at a couple of things tonight, I, th I hope that this is going to bring out some thoughts and some in, into our own hearts and in our own lives, and, and maybe it'll make, a, make us bring in a point to where we say, oh me, oh my, God check me. I don't know about you, but I, I like to say that daily, God check me, God, God what, do, what needs to be changed in my own life, Amen. Looking at Romans chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, look at what it says. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to a corruptible man, and to birds and to the four-footed beast and creeping things. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you again, tonight father we want to thank you for the blessings that you've given us thank you for this opportunity that you've allowed us to join together with our brothers and sisters in christ and to worship and praise you whether we be in service or we're watching on live stream or we're we're tuning in later father i'm praying right now that something will be said over the next few moments something will be done father that would touch and minister to our hearts and lives father give us the encouragement that's needed we forever give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen and Amen. Let's take a look here tonight. Verses 22 and 23, we're talking about pride. We've been talking over the last couple of Wednesday nights things that God rejects. God does not like ungodliness. God does not like uh, things that's un, uh, unrighteous. God does not... There's things that, of mankind that God does not like. And one of those things is pride but I'm gonna I'm gonna venture to say tonight and I think I can be so bold to say that there's going to be some things that's brought out in the next few moments that whenever you really stop to think about pride that some of the things that I'm going to mention some of the things that we're going to bring out is not something that you would think would be tied to pride pride a lot of times look I'm proud of my daughter she went yesterday, not that I would say I understand all these things, all of what they're doing, but she went yesterday and she, she is now a green belt in karate. All that means to me is she knows how to do something and she's got a green belt that goes around her waist. She comes in there and she starts, Daddy, can I do my forms on you? I don't know about that. Don't know what you mean? You better go over there somewhere. <laughs> I need to practice, not on me, you or not. Are you scared? You doggone skippy, I'm scared. I don't know what that dude's teaching her over the... No, I'm joking, y'all. I'm, pl I'm playing. I do. We do know what they're teaching. I'm just playing. 
uh, you know, she, she sits there and she'll start doing these, these karate chops on me. And Brother Chuck, I just go over and I just grab her arm one good time. She said, that's cheating. I said, I don't care. You think I'm going to let you hit me? No. She, I said, you can't do nothing. This is all muscle. And it ain't muscle. But the, <laughs> here's the thing about it. Am I proud of what my daughter has done? Most definitely I am. As parents, you're, pr you're proud of what your, what your kids accomplish. You're proud that your kids are not in jail. I mean, you're proud that your kids have done things. I'm sure my mom and dad is proud that we're not in jail. I'm sure. Is that the same thing of what we're talking about in this, of what we're talking about in pride? So is that, does that mean that there's something wrong of being proud of what your kids have accomplished? No. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's great to be, a, be, be proud of what, what's been accomplished. When you and, when you and your spouse, whenever uh, you've accomplished something, there's nothing wrong with, be, with, ha, with being proud of what you've done. But the second that you let what you've done go above what God has done in your life, or you think that what you've done has been accomplished in what you've done all on your own, now we're getting in the problem. Now we're getting in an area called sin. Amen? So let's take a look here for just a moment. There are pride. Let's, let's back up. Let's look at this. First of all, we need to understand something. God is the one and only true living God. And He will show wrath when man becomes prideful and turns away from Him. Away from God. One of the greatest tragedies in all of human history is repeated time and time and time again. One of the greatest tragedies is not when, when, when Rome fell. One of the greatest tragedies is not when the Great Wall of China fell. One of the greatest tragedies is not when I lost checkers to my granddad. It was devastating to me, but that was not one of the great... Look, it was devastating every time. He beat me every time. But that is not the most devastating thing that ever happened in history. Mankind's history, if, if I was to ask you what would be the world, the, the most significant thing that happened in mankind's history, some of you would say something that would happen, you know, the recession or uh, when the stock market fell, some, things like that. Some of you would, would go through, the, would say something about the Great Depression or, or something like that. Some of you would actually even say when mankind hung Jesus on the cross. But here's the thing. There was something in, in the works when mankind hung Jesus on the cross more than it was God's will or God's plan for salvation. It was pride where man was thinking they can do it without God. When man starts thinking that we can, we can make it, we can do things without God, that's a, that's a form of pride. I want to show you this. Look at this. The scene that we see is man rejecting God and claiming that man is too wise to believe in God. When man believes that mankind is too intelligent to depend on the fables that is found in the Word of God. When man thinks that they are capable, too capable not to look at one's own self. When man thinks that we're too resourceful to create everything for a future, when man, for a future on our own self when man does not think that we don't have to when man thinks that we don't have to look to God and that we're too masterful to do things and we can do it all on our own and man is rejecting and, and rejecting God and claiming that he is too reasonable or rational not to create his own standards and his own laws to control life. When man thinks that he can operate and do all of this on our own, we have become full of pride. How do you, how do you come to that conclusion, Brother Andy? Simply this. Pride is not thinking that you don't have... Pride is thinking you don't have to go to somebody 
or someone to receive help. Let me tell y'all something. I know this is a shock to most of you in here, but I'm going to say it because there may be somebody watching on live stream that would think that this is a shock. I doubt they think it is, but I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. I'm not an auto mechanic. No comment from the front row. I am not an auto mechanic. I took my vehicle to the shop today. <laughs> when I pull up, they automatically know <laughs> I ain't got a clue what I'm doing. I, I, don't, I, I know how to check the oil in my car. That's the, that's the one that's, that's the blue liquid in the front, right? I'm joking. I play and I promise. I know how to check the oil. Don't even start with me. I know how to check the oil. I, I can put windshield wiper fluid in there. But as far when it comes to other things, I don't have the tools. I don't have the resources, nor do I have the knowledge. And to be honest with you, I don't have the patience to do it. So I took my vehicle to the shop today, and I'm so glad I did. You, you know that if there's a nail in your tire, it will let the air out? Brother Emery, after I talked to you, guess what we found in my tire? I almost thought that the folks down at the mechanic shop put it in there just on purpose, but we won't go there. I know enough about vehicles to know that I need to ask for help. I do know how to change a tire. I do know how to get that tire out of the trunk of my car. And I can put it on the side. I can, I can, I can loosen the lug nuts and I can tighten them back down. I know how to do that much. But let me tell you something. When you start getting into a lot of things, I don't know how to do it. Now, I could go, and I'm sure I could learn. I don't have the desire to do that. I don't have the willpower to do that. I do know that I can ask for assistance in that area. And I know that I am not above asking for that assistance. Now, I could have been very... I know this is just a funny example. I get this. I get this. And if my brother is watching this, he is just falling in the floor laughing because he knows how such a great mechanic that I am. We was changing the battery on my car one time, and I was, y'all, I had taken it down to the auto parts place, and I had them, this was several years ago, and I had them to check the battery, and sure enough, it was a bad battery, so we get the new battery, bring it out, and we're changing it. My brother, Brother Kevin, my brother calls me up because I, had, I was on the phone with him when I got in the car. This has been years ago. I got in the car, and I was on, my, on the phone with my brother, and my battery was dead. And so he knew, you know, what was going on, and he said, Do I need to come jump you off? I said, No, I got my neighbors out in the yard. I'll get him, blah, blah, blah. So we get down there, and my brother calls me back to make sure, <laughs> to make sure that I did not try to change the battery myself, that I let them change the battery. I said, now, Jesse, I know how to change. They was changing my battery when he called. I said, now, Jesse, I know how to change the battery of my car. He said, I doubt that. I said, Jesse, it's not that hard. It's even got colors on it. I know that I put the red. Y'all, it was perfect timing, too. I said, I know I put the red cord on the black one, and I put the black cord on the red thing. I know how to do this. Yes, I had them crossed on purpose. I knew what I was doing, but I had them crossed on purpose. And about that time, the fire truck was going by. Y'all, it was perfect time, and I couldn't have planned that any better. And we was, we was at O'Reilly's in Anniston, and so we're right there on Quintard, and the fire truck comes right by. I said, hang on just a second. The fire truck's pulling up. They wasn't pulling up. He said, what's the fire truck pulling up for? I said, I have no idea. You called, and all of a sudden something happened, and there's smoke coming out from under the hood of my car. He said, where, where, where are you at? I said, I'm on the side of the road. He said, I'm on my way. Where are you at? And the guy that was there at O'Reilly's that's putting the, 
putting the battery in he's just he he, he dropped his tools in the end of the engine we're having to chase them out I mean it was so funny it was hilarious the I have no idea what the point of that was but anyway the point is I know to ask okay I know to ask for help I can I could do this stuff and y'all I, I would I, I would blow the engine up on my car but I know that I need to ask if I thought for a moment that I could do some of these things on my own by myself and I did not ask then guess what that's pride that's pride now we're looking at what pride is we see this funny story this comical story but we're seeing an example of what pride could have been it could have been that fire truck pulling up for my car but look I know to ask for help a lot of times this is a hard thing for Christians Christians have a hard time to ask for help so let's look at something here I want you to understand something in denying God and in, in denying to ask God for help in our lives in denying to ask God for assistance in our lives mankind makes two mistakes first of all man without by not asking God for help by saying, God, I can do it on my own. By not believing that prayer matters, as we're talking about on Sundays. By not believing that prayer matters, man has said, I can do it all by myself. We have denied that God makes a difference in our lives. Man professes themselves to be wise, but in doing so, they become fools. One simple reason, one simple reason, and one simple reason only. What we need to understand, first of all, is God does exist. Close it down. We can go home. We've got it. God exists. And therefore, because God exists, why not ask Him for help? When we go to college and we go to or we go to high school, we go to college, you got those teachers there to ask for help. Why would we be so such a foolish student and not asking help from our teachers? When we go and we get a job and, and they're gonna train us on how to do that job, why not ask for assistance instead of making ourselves look foolish months down the road? We need to ask for help that's the same way it is with God folks that's the same way it is with God God has clearly revealed himself both within man's thoughts and through creation we've talked about that over the last couple of Wednesday nights we've talked about how that through creation we see that God does exist I talked we talked about it a couple of Wednesday nights ago and we said simply this you know what they teach in school that the that the creation of the entire universe happened by a big bang theory and all of a sudden there was nothing in and bang, something happened, and all of a sudden, all is in cre all of creation is ex is in existence. Well, guess what? You know what? If that's what you want to believe, then I know for a fact that my God is what caused the big bang to happen. Amen. What was that big bang? God said it, and it happened. There's the bang. God's words is all powerful. I'm sure that yesterday, uh, yesterday, whenever the uh, the thundering and the lightning came through and it rattled the buildings, you know what? I'm sure that when God speaks, I'm sure it rattles a whole lot more than just a building. Amen. I'm sure that when God speaks, uh, the very soul of mankind is going to quake. There's your bang. There's the bang that happens when God speaks it. All of a sudden, the waters start parting and makes the dry land there's the bang all of a sudden God spoke into existence and the birds of the airs came and the, and the fish of the sea happened there's the bang it's going to happen just because God said it we know by looking at creation that create that God does exist man's hearts and minds when they become empty of God 
they have to be filled with something else. Do you remember the example a, a couple of services ago when we had the example of the table sitting out here and if I filled it, if we had a glass of milk and we had glass of waters, was that last Wednesday night? I think it was. Nobody remembers. I don't either. But we had the examples of the, of the glasses. I didn't have them physically here. It was all in our imagination. But the thing that we had was when it starts being emptied with, some, emptied with what's there, something fills the place. Remember, I remember when in our chemistry class and science class in high school, whenever, whenever you've got a void, it's going, something is going to fill that void. It's going to be gas. It's going to be air. Something is going to fill. Well, when the Spirit of God is within us and we start pouring out the Spirit of God and we don't ask for God to come back, we don't ask God to pour the Spirit back in us, we don't get under the spout where the glory comes out, we don't get our time alone with God, we feel like that we can can make it on our own then guess what happens we pour it out so much that it's going to be filled with something you better think about that you need to think about that as Christians amen let's look on we have to have something to believe in we've got to have some kind of guiding light or some kind of principle to give purpose and meaning and direction in our lives when we, re when we allow God when we say that we're, we're just as good without God and we don't have to have God in our lives and we, we replace Him with something else guess what we have something else some kind of standard some kind of law some kind of rule some kind of person some kind of God God that we guide our lives with we dethrone God and erase him from our lives and then we imagine and create our own God within our minds some people will create a God out of work some people create a God God out of money some people create a God out of their families some people keep create a God out of out of anything that will fill that void in their life when we do that, we have become very prideful. Man will reason and speculate about the ultimate source of life. And whatever they come up with is what they give their lives over to. I think it's so... I was honestly fixing to say the word funny, but I detract that. I retract that. I think it is so sad... You have people, they're on fire for God. They could be a great worker in the kingdom of God. They could be a great church worker. They could be a great uh, asset in the kingdom of God. And then all of a sudden, whatever it may have been, whether it be they've elevated themselves or somebody's elevated them, something has happened and they start falling away from God. And then they start filling their lives with something else. All of a sudden, it was all about God, all about church, all about, all about Bible, all about praying, all about getting along with God. And now all of a sudden, it's not about praying anymore. It's about doing this over here. And, and you know what? This over here is going to cost so much more that I've got to read less. And all of a sudden, this is going to cost so much more that I, I'm going to start missing service. Oh, you better, you better hush that. Don't, don't go there. You're going to step on people's toes by talking about that. You know what? I'm not, I, you know, I, I, I get told that a lot. I stepped on somebody's toes. Brother Andy, you sure did step on my toes this morning. I had to go out and buy me some steel toe boots so I could come into church. You stepped on my toes so much. I'm so sorry. My aim is off. I wasn't aiming at your feet. I am not a foot person. I do not have a, a love of feet. Somebody comes around and tells y'all, when I walk in the house, I, I, ca I can't stand for stuff to be on my feet. When I walk into the house, my shoes and my socks are off. 
I, I, can't, I can't handle it. I, I, I don't like things on my feet. I wear house shoes because I've learned that sometimes people will knock on the front door. Did y'all know that? We've got a doorbell. They don't, knock, they don't ring the doorbell. They knock on the front door. I, it, it don't ever bother me. But if you ever come to the house and it's during the day and I, happen to, and, and, and I happen to be there, I'm not running around doing something else, and I happen to be there, you will probably see house shoes on my feet. And that's only because those house shoes are in the living room because you knocked on the door. So don't make fun of my gray house shoes. Because the second you leave, they're off. And if you want me to go somewhere with you and you knock on the door, you're going to have to wait a minute. i got to go get some socks and shoes. I don't like anything on my feet. And, and Miss Katie, poor Miss Katie, she'll come through. I'm sitting in that recliner and I'll have my feet propped up and she'll come over there and, and I'm not paying her no attention. She wants to touch the bottom of my foot. Why? Because I scream. I've, lo I've let y'all in on a secret. Don't tell anybody. You want to hear me scream? Touch the bottom of my foot. But thank goodness I'm I've got shoes on when I'm around you. I don't have an aim towards your feet. I'm aiming for your heart. I don't ever want to step on somebody's foot. People step on my feet physically a lot. I don't want people to step on my feet. I don't want to step on your feet. I want to, I, I'm aiming for the heartstrings. We want to pull at the heartstrings. Amen? That's when, that's when our lives start changing. When some, look, if I step on your foot, what do you do? You pull your foot back, right? More than likely you're going to say, well, I walked on the bottom, you can walk on the top. Everybody, I've had people tell me that all the time. I had somebody in here, we won't say who, Said, oh, you can step on that one all day long. It don't bother, I don't feel it. But the, fact, but the fact of the matter is, it's the same way with the heartstrings. When you start, when you start going towards those heartstrings, you're going to make a change in your life. Amen? You're going to make a difference. Something's going to change in your life. Amen? And this is the problem that the, the church world has, is folks, they don't like people going after their heart. So what do they do? They're going to make a change. They're going to start backing away. They don't want to make a change in their lives. And you know what that is? That's called pride. That's called pride. I can do it on my own. I don't have to pray as much as I used to. Oh, Jesus. I don't have to read as much as I... Y'all, I've read the Bible. I, you know, some people will say, I've read the Bible a dozen times. I don't have to read it the 13th time. Oh, me, oh, my. Somebody asked me the other day, have you ever read such and such in the Bible? I'm, what in the world are you talking about? I probably read the verse a dozen times, Brother Hodo, and I didn't have a clue what they was talking about. But guess what? It's in there. Every time you read, you're going to get something new. We need to get pride out of our lives. Isaiah 29 and 14. Isaiah 29 and 14 tells us this therefore behold I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people even a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid let me just go ahead and let you know something when you think you got God figured out he's gonna change everything on you and you ain't gonna have God figured out what do you mean I thought God God couldn't change it ain't a matter of matter of God changing God's gonna do something in your life that you ain't never seen before God should never surprise you but God always surprises us why because whatever you face God it did not catch God by surprise God knew it was going to happen. You know what? That seems like somebody that I might want in my corner. Amen. If, it's, if God's got the game plan, I want him on my side. 
I want to be on the same side as him. Amen? Here's a, here's a great verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. I'm going to tell you right now, this is an outstanding verse. People think they've got God figured out. We think that, that, that God cannot do anything new. God cannot do anything that's going to shock us. God's not going to do anything that's going to surprise us. God's not going to turn our world upside down. Let me tell you something. God's turned my world upside down, upside down so many times. I, don't think you got it figured out because guess what? God will change it. God will turn it upside down for Him to get the glory and Him to get the honor. Why does God do this? Why does God do this? Take a look. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Look at what it says. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Have you ever tried to explain the things of God to an unsaved person I've had people often come to me and they'll say they'll, tell, they'll come to me and they'll say brother Andy how do I explain the manifestation and I've already figured out as soon as they say manifestation I'm thinking oh Lord Jesus God help us all How do I explain the manifestation on the day of Pentecost? Now, when they get that head going like that, now we're all over. How do I explain the manifestation of the power of the Holy Ghost as it was on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 whenever the Holy Ghost fell in the upper room and they was, they was all thinking on the accordion And clothed feet, clothed, clothed feet like fire fell down from heaven. And I'm thinking, you cannot explain it because you ain't got it. But they try to explain something, things like that. They try to explain it to their, uh, their atheist granddaddy or, their, or somebody that is uh, older and much wiser than them that don't believe in God or that's not saved. Well, let me tell you something. Let me let you in on something. Those that are not Christians, they've been doing it a lot longer than some Christians have been being Christians. We've talked about how that some religions, they start training their children at the, at the very early age of diaperhood what their religion means. So you're not going to change them overnight. Brother Andy, I know that God can save them overnight just like that. I did not say God couldn't. I said you're not going to change them overnight. You better not even try unless you've got the Spirit of God flowing in your life. Brother Andy, what, then how are we supposed to be a witness? You need to tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ and the salvation of God, and you need to leave the less rest of it and let God do the explaining. You need to let God start working in their lives. You need to allow the manifestation of the Holy Spirit just as it was on the day of Pentecost that fell in the upper room when they was all in one mind and one accord, not an accordion. And they had the cloven tongues as of fire that fell upon them. You need to allow that to be a reality in their lives. Let them experience that. You need to just lead them to the cross. Why? I'm glad you I'm so glad you asked that. I'll answer it right here. Look. Look right here. Look at 1 Corinthians 1 and 18. 
but unto us which are saved it do you know what the word it is it is a pre- is, is something is a part of is a part of the english language and it is pointing back to something it is something to fill in the place and it's pointing back to something it's high time that we quit trying to explain everything and start being an it and port back to the cross of calvary well where'd you get that from look 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 and 19. For the preaching of the cross, that's the it. We're supposed to be presenting the cross of Calvary to folks, not everything else. But us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Let me tell you something. We're not going to be as wise as we think we are. God is so much wiser. God is so much wiser. Amen? We need to allow God to work in our lives. Let's move on. We've got just a few more moments and we're going to finish. We'll finish looking here. All right, look at this. Ooh. Look at verse 22. Professing them to be wise, they became foolish. Excuse me, verse 21. But that which they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful and become vain in their imaginations and their foolishness of heart. Foolish heart were, was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and the creeping things. Let's take a look at verse 23 here. Let's take a look at what it's telling us here. Verse 23. Get back to where we was at. Technology is wonderful except when it goes. All right, now let's look at this. Man exchanged the incorruptible God for some... For a, man exchanged the incorruptible God for an inc- a corruptible idol. God is the only one that is incorruptible. This word incorruptible means non-decaying, imperishable, unchanging, and unaging. Incorruptible means that God is not subject to passing away. He is eternal. God has always been, always will be, and always will exist. In other words, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Men swap and exchange. Exchange God for a corruptible idol. Mankind has put money before God multiple times. Mankind has put jobs before God multiple times. Mankind has put cars and property and possessions before God multiple times. Let me tell you something your property can be destroyed. Your automobile, your possessions, your money can go up in smoke. God is not going anywhere. The question would be, where did you leave God? Amen? Man swap God for corruptible things. They make themselves and mankind the God of life the master of the world, the makers of their own destiny, the lawgivers of their own laws, the determiners of their own morality, the standard by which which their lives are to be governed. In other words, mankind takes this right here and says, I don't want it in my life anymore. I don't like that verse. Give me a magic marker and I'm going to cross it out. I don't like that page. I'm just going to tear the whole page out and throw it in the trash. I don't believe in what this is telling me. This is saying I cannot do certain things and I don't like it. So therefore, I'm going to just throw it to the side. When we start living our lives like that, 
we've made ourselves like as of God. We're making our own rules. Let me tell you something. I don't need to be the standard by which you make your life. I don't need to be the standard. You don't need to try to dress like me. You don't need to eat like me. You don't need to walk like me. I had pe- I've had people to tell me, I wish I could preach like you. No, you don't. You need to try to preach better than me. I've had people say, I don't, I'd love to shout like you. No, you don't. You ain't been through what I've been through. Don't make me your standard. When we start making mankind our standard and we start making ourselves the standard with which we live, let me tell you something. This is a flawable standard. Do y'all know what a standard is? I'm sure they've got it in the railroad. I'm sure that they've got it. In, they've got it. I know they've got it in construction. They've got a standard for which they go by. I remember when we was building. Please don't laugh. I remember when we was building the Alexander Valley Church of God. They let me operate the table saw. I don't know if it was because they figured that I would be on the ground and they would let me operate and I was the only one I could injure because they went and let me up there with the nail gun. I don't know which one was more dangerous, the nail gun or the saw. I think everybody felt like the saw was because that's where they left me at. And so my job sometimes was to sit down here when we was building the second floor of the built of the church building. My job, we had a big old stack of two by fours over here. And I would pick them up, I'd put them on the saw, and there was a standard to which I was cut that I was to cut that board. That saw was sitting on a table, and down here at one side or the other. There was a board nailed in place. And I put this big long two by four, whether it was 10 foot or 12 foot, depending on which ones we was needing that day. And I would put it on there and I pushed it as far as I could go to that standard. The saw wasn't moving. That's not moving. And I would take it and I would, and I would throw the board up. Now, a lot of times they would holler back down just because they knew who I was. And they would ask me, did you cut it a straight? Did you cut a straight line? Did you actually push the two by four all the way to the block, the standard? Every once in a while they would call down and they would say, if all of them was supposed to be, I don't know, I don't remember, that's been a long time ago. If all of them was supposed to be eight foot long, Every once in a while they would call down and they would say I needed something at a, and they would call another measurement. And I would have to get my standard, my tape measure out and I would measure and I would cut it. Of course they'd holler and they'd say, do you know how to read a tape measure? If people ain't picking on me, I think something's wrong. But the, but the, fo- the point that we're making is simply this. We need to have a standard to which we're living our lives by. We need not be prideful. We need to have a standard to which we govern and live our lives by. We need to make sure that our lives are living up to a standard of our what our lifestyle should be like. Not just haphazardly, not just nonchalant. We need to be we need to have a standard in our life of what our life needs to live by. Too many Christians today feel like I could just I can just fly by the seat of my pants and nothing will happen. Sometimes we're like Job and we say, by the skin of my teeth, we're gonna just slip right on by. Let me tell you something. I think that we need to work hard to live up to the standard of living. Amen. Let's pray. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, again as we come to you today, Father God, we want to thank you for the blessings that you've given us. 
God, I want to thank you for this opportunity that you've allowed us to join together as brothers and sisters in Christ and worship and praise you. Father, I have presented your word as you have given it to us. And Father, I'm praying right now that you would help us to continuously live to the standard that we need to live by. Help us to continuously live to what you would want us to be in our lives. And God, we thank you for all that's been accomplished and all that you're going to continue to do. God, it's all these things that we ask in your Son's precious, holy, and righteous name we pray. And the church said, Amen and Amen. Those that may be watching us on live feed, appreciate you being here with us tonight on our live stream. May the good Lord bless you as our prayer. Sunday school, Sunday morning at 945, worship at 11. Allow God to work in your life through the rest of this week. May God bless you. Amen.